Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, welcome to Riceville Valley Community Church, where we get to worship God together. It's really good to see you, everyone here uh, on a summer day, all of you here in person. And one of the folks that uh, doesn't often get to be here in person, but who's here in spirit, but who is here in person has a special day tomorrow, too, and that's Carol, whose birthday is tomorrow. So let's wish Carol a happy birthday. Or give her, let's clap. Let's clap and wish her a happy birthday because uh, later on, um, y'all are invited to snacks and fellowship hall after worship. Um, so we could sing happy birthday there too. Uh, another announcement that I have is, is that one of the ministries, one of the local ministries that we support is Black Mountain Home for Children. And <clears throat> this year they're hosting uh, a dinner for donors. Now, Mike Wilson, I think, has been before. So, Mike, could you tell us a little bit more about it? And if you are interested, see if you can, see if you can get back to Mike or myself uh, in a couple Sundays just by the end of the month so we could RSVP so folks like Jesse and Susie can pr prepare adequately, right? Uh, one, last, one last announcement is that we've kicked off the process to elect the next ruling elder for our church. And... Being a ruling elder, uh, it's a calling, but what the calling is all about and what you do as a ruling elder, you can get those questions answered if you have them. I tried to summarize what that's all about in a little one-page handout here on uh, the table below. So if you, have, if you are considering being an elder, pick it up. If you're a member and you're gonna vote on who the elder is, um, pick it up. And if you're a current elder and if you'd like a refresher, pick it up. It's a, it's a good reminder for the awesome responsibility it is, it is to shepherd God's people. And we do it as a team. And we call that team Session. So please be in prayer about that for our church. Uh, anyone else have any announcements? Hearing none. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. To help us prepare our hearts for worship, we usually read a bit of scripture first. This morning's scripture might be a familiar one. It comes from Isaiah chapter 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall Clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. 
and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And the thing I wanted to highlight about this passage in particular is the direction of how things happen, right? It comes from heaven, right, the skies, when it comes to rain and snow, to the earth, right? It go, it's, goes in one direction, and where it lands is where all the activity happens, right? Just like, just like when God speaks, just like when God makes a promise, it's going to happen here on earth, right? On earth where you are, where the mountains and the hills and the trees and all the cypress and myrtle, where God's name is supposed to be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. And the word, the word that is supposed to go forth, the word that has gone forth, is the word in flesh in Jesus Christ, who God the Father sent to accomplish his purpose of salvation. That's why we're here together for worship. It's to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. And we do that together. Let me pray for us. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here, may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here, may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here, may the tempted find help and the sorrowful find comfort. Here, may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here, may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please stand for God's call to worship. All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who yearn for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, has washed over us, and our gracious and holy God beckons and blesses us. Drink deeply of these living waters. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Glory, Glory to you. you. Now let, let's remain standing and sing our first song, Blessed Assurance.
be seated. God's the one who speaks first, and when we get together for worship, it is a dialogue. That's why we sing songs to him, and that's also how God speaks to us. And when we approach a holy God together, we're also made aware of how we are not holy and how we fall short. And that's God's grace to know that because of Jesus, we have forgiveness. So the scripture passage that calls us to confess our sins comes from Psalm 139 today. The psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Please spend just a couple minutes individually, privately, asking God to search your hearts. And then we'll together pray corporately and confess our sins. Let's pray. Let's confess our sins together. Merciful God, we confess that we have often failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The assurance that we are forgiven is because of Jesus alone. But coming, going back to Psalm 139, it says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They unnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. God is still with you, even when you sin, even when you fall short because of Jesus. He's the one that covers your sins and where you can find forgiveness and the joy in that. Brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Hallelujah. So what we're gonna do now is sing in response to the, to the declaration that you are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Let's stand.
at this time in our worship, this is where Jesus shines too, where he is our great high priest, our humble high priest, who intercedes, who prays for us. And that's how we have the chance for us to pray together to God. <clears throat> we pray together because we obey God's word, which says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's join together in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come on the coattails of our great high priest, our worship leader, our intercessor, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we offer our prayers and thanksgivings to you, Holy Spirit, bring to mind people and places who need your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we indeed, we say happy birthday to Micah, and we thank you for the ex yet another extension of grace and mercy in his life. May you continue to grant more of that in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. my wife Susan uh, a safe uh, travel to New England this past week and uh, that she's had a, a sweet time with her family. I pray that you'd be with her for her next few days there and as she sees, uh, sees other friends and uh, that you would be present with her as she goes to the memorial service of one of her friends um, who does not seem to have belonged to you, and, but that your light would shine to all of those who are, who are there and that you would make yourself known. Yes, Lord, our church family continues to thank you for family. We pray that you'd bless Swig and those around her as she mourns with those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, how precious family is. Lord, we pray specifically for Daryl's upcoming appointment. Lord, heal and restore his body. Give us insight on how to do that. Have mercy on his body. Have mercy on this precious family who are here in the pews today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Lord, we thank you for the Turpins and for Jim, who has been presiding, leading us into your presence every Sunday. Father, I pray that their trip would indeed be a restful and refreshing one. Lord, thank you for their faithfulness. Have mercy on them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
Lord, the, the demand for, for medical services continues to outpace the providers. So Lord, please have mercy on people, on us, all of us who are needy in our bodies in some form or another at some point in time or another. Lord, fill those positions with people whose hearts are to care and to serve. Lord, have mercy on all of us. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you've promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together as we are here today in his name, you'll be in the midst of them. Thank you. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us as we together now pray to you in one voice the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our worship by giving our tithes and offerings. Father in heaven, thank you for breath, for life, for all the things that you've blessed us with, that you've given us. Oh Lord, may these resources that we give back to you continue to be stewarded well in your honor so that the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ would go forth, that those would come to know the love that they have in Christ Jesus, whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's uh, scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 5, a little bit of that, and then Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 18. <clears throat> Paul writes, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, 
So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then moving a little forward in to Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 1. Paul again writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, couldn't do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who doesn't have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we pray for your spirit, Lord, to illuminate our eyes and our hearts to see Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would bless your word going forth as it was just read, as it will be preached. Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. A couple weeks ago, uh, we asked the question, what's wrong with me? If you ask the question, what's wrong with me, with humility, then we could say, you're starting to get to a place where you could find real God-honoring change in your life. The answer to the question, what's wrong with me, at the deepest theological level is this. It's sin. Sin with a capital S. Sin meaning the sins you commit, whether by breaking God's law, by doing the things that you shouldn't do, or by doing the things, or I'm sorry, or by not doing the things that you should be doing. And it's sin, meaning this all-controlling sinful nature in you that you inherit from your mom and dad going all the way back to Adam and Eve. 
That's what the Apostle Paul calls the flesh in Romans, in our particular version of Romans. The power of sin is the answer to these questions from Romans chapter 7, from from the chapter before ours today. Why can't I do what I know is good, I want to do good, but I can't. Instead, I end up doing wrong the exact thing I don't want to do. What's wrong with me? Today, we're going to ask a different, but it's a related question. Today's question is, where are you? Where are you? When you ask the question, where are you? You could be asking one of actually very many different things, right? You could be asking about location, right? Location because you want to locate someone or something so you can better understand what's going on. So where are you? Well, you're here in a sanctuary built in 1895 off of Riceville Road in Buncombe County in Western North Carolina in the United States on Earth in the Milky Way. And I don't think I could zoom out beyond that, but that tells you something about you. It tell, and based off of the time of day, Sunday, and that it's around 11.30, I hope, is that where you are based on the time of day will tell you a little bit more about yourself. Right? So if you ask the same question, where are you on a different day, at a different time, right? how would you answer that question? And then even when you talk about location, that can mean different things too, depending on the kind of chart or map we're talking about, right? Like locating you on the family tree. That's what I had to do as a new pastor here in the valley, had to map out the family trees as you share all these things about your different family members. And also, depending on what kind of chart you're using, like the company or chart, to locate you on that or on the spectrum, say where you are on, with autism on the spectrum. Right? Locating you helps you understand more about you. And another thing you could be asking when you ask where are you is that you could find, what you're really asking is status, right? Like what's going on? Like, where are you with this task that, task that you started? Or where are you with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Are y'all still in a relationship? Or where are you with your mother or with your father with respect to their assisted living needs? You ask, where are you? Because in general, there are places to go, things to do, and people to see, right? Now, why would you want to know answers to all these different permutations to the question, where are you? Well, it tells you, as I said, about more about who you are. It's an identity question. What your context is in which you live your location in life, and your status with life. Depending on where you are location-wise, and where you are with people in your life, and where you are with tasks you're doing or not doing, your situation can be either a good one or a bad one. In terms, in these terms then, Asking the question, where are you, could be another way of asking, 
what's wrong with me? In our passage today, it holds up two different, quote unquote, locations or context to the question, where are you? Again, just like sin, in the ultimate theological deepest sense, according to our passage, is that you are either in the flesh or in Christ Jesus. You are either in the flesh or in Christ Jesus. The former is a bad situation. The latter is a good one. Each have their own respective tasks and relationships. So let's see if we can take a look at our passage now to see if you can, Lord willing, locate yourself. Verse 1, right? let me see if I can pop it back up. Verse 1, we, read a few, we read a few verses from Romans chapter 5 earlier to give us a little bit of context of Romans chapter 8. And here, we could summarize Romans chapter 5 in terms of verse 1 of our passage this way. Because of the fall of one, there is therefore condemnation for those who are born in Adam. And to use the Apostle Paul's word, there is therefore condemnation for those in the flesh. That's everyone. That's sin in everyone. Everyone sins and everyone is sinned against. Everyone dies. That's Romans 5. But, but because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, of another one, because of the gospel, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Instead of condemn- condemnation, there's forgiveness. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Now, verse 2 tells us there's more than just no condemnation. In Jesus, there's freedom. In the context of your life, when that context is Jesus, there's freedom from sin that controls your life when you are outside of Jesus. Outside of Jesus, you're stuck in sin with, and with the things that are going to kill you, but the Holy Spirit sets you free. Right? There's a way out in Christ Jesus because he sacrificed himself on the cross, and the spirit of life is more powerful than death since he raised Jesus from the dead. And then verse 3 to 4 tells us the who, the how, and the why people are set free from sin and death. Who could actually free you from the vicious cycle of sin? God can. The Holy Spirit of life did. God did it by sending his own son to be a human being. What, what's Christmas all about? Christmas is not about a particular birthday, but it's a whole new way of being for God himself. Right? God entered into the location, into the context, into the situation of humanity that's subjected to sin. He became flesh without having sin himself, so that he could be a sin offering. In that way, God condemns sin in the human nature of Jesus on the cross. What that means is all sin, all of sin has been judged. Sin is condemned so that those who are where? In Christ Jesus are not condemned themselves. There is therefore 
now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they all have taken sin and death to task in the gospel of Christ Jesus. That's the who and the how. The why. Why why would God do that? Why would God send forth his word? Why would God send forth his eternal word from heaven to be like us? It's so that he could set you free from the power of sin and death, according to verse 4, so that your freedom can find a purpose in life. Your purpose in life, regardless of where you live, where you're at, is verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The requirements of the law. Verses 3 and 4 talk about the law of God. What that means is the law of God, think of it this way. It's like God assigns you because he made you. He has every right to give you your job description to reflect who he is, to give you tasks. We find that in the law. What the law is this. What the law is is this. It's God's will for human beings to love God and their neighbor. It's not too long or elaborate of a job description. But even though it sounds simple, it's one of the hardest things to do. That's because the law, that job description, that task list itself, in itself cannot motivate, it cannot empower you to do what's right especially when you are outside of Jesus Christ, where there's sin that dominates with its power and its rules. It's not that what God wants for people isn't clear. It's that no one, want, no one can be fully free to obey because of the power of sin. With Jesus, the law doesn't condemn you anymore. The guilty verdict doesn't apply to you in Christ Jesus. Your your relationship with God has changed. Because of the relationship with God in Christ, where your status is not guilty, but righteous, it frees you to live differently so that the law might be fulfilled in us. God sets right with himself sinners so that they would do right to others for him. But that's not for everyone. That only applies to those who walk, according to our passage, according to the Spirit. Now, the rest of the verses, right? The rest of the verses, verses 5 to 11, compare what it looks like for someone who walks according to the flesh versus someone who walks according to the spirit. Walking according to the flesh is a bad situation. Your location, so to speak, in life is in the flesh. Your status before God is condemnation. Verse 5 says, you task yourself with things that that makes sense in your setting, things of the flesh, things and relationships that harm you and others. Verse six says, you preoccupy yourself with things everyone knows that will eventually shrivel your soul and kill you. You You still have a relationship with God for sure, in this setting, but it's a hostile one 
with God, as it says in verse 7. And then verse 8 says, where you are with pleasing God is nowhere, since where you are with God's law is that you will not submit to it. You're going to refuse step zero. You refuse humility. Where you are with Jesus is that you don't have his spirit. As it says in verse 9, anyone who doesn't have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. In other words, those who walk according to the flesh, that describes someone who's not a Christian, who doesn't follow Christ. And you know, do you remember that God also asks this question? God also asks the question, where are you? Do you all remember? God asks this question after Adam and Eve sinned. It's not that, remember the story where after they eat, you know, they, they like, they realize they're, well, they realize that they're, they're naked and they're ashamed and they hide. And then God asks the question, where are you? <laughs> but it's not like God doesn't know the, the GPS coordinates of his own creatures, right? God asks, where are you? So that God can let Adam locate himself in his own failure to obey and to see where Adam was at with owning up to his own sins. And then, unfortunately, Adam locates the blame with Eve and then she with the serpent. And all three of them stood condemned. And then what happens next is that God dislocates Adam and Eve, right? He exiles them out of the Garden of Eden. And then they died, just as God said. And so everyone else since then. Now, that's the story of Adam. Listen again to Romans chapter 5, this time remembering Adam and now thinking about Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, Paul compares Adam and Christ like this. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Now, how does this work? How, how does this work, this abundance of grace, be known by people, right? If it's only just one man, Jesus, right? He's not, he has not given birth like Adam and Eve had, right? The answer is through the Spirit of Christ. By the grace of God, the Spirit of God relocates you from being in the flesh to being united into Christ by faith so you could walk according to the Spirit. Your status before God in Christ is not condemnation, but righteousness. Verse, back in uh, verse 5, says, you task yourself with things, again, that makes sense in your setting, things of the spirit of life. Verse 6 says, you preoccupy yourself with things that bring life, right? that bring life and peace to yourself and to other people. And again, you have a relationship with God for sure, but it's a loving one. Since you have the spirit of Christ, you belong to God as a son or a daughter, as it says in verse 9. Folks united to Christ walk according to the Spirit. 
They set their mind on places to go, things to do, and people to see according to the Spirit. That sounds fine and all, right? You go to church on Sunday for about an hour, these days maybe a little bit more than an hour, and then you say hi to a few folks and try not to sin. That all sounds manageable. But this is where you find out talking the talk may be easier than walking the walk. Later on in Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us walking according to the Spirit requires you to own up to your own sins and start killing it. It requires you to own up to your own sins and take it to task. The spiritual task list has to include killing your own sins. Not only do your sinful habits need to suffer, you yourself will suffer. Romans also speaks to how you should treat each other when you see people you don't like, when you look down on someone, And when you see people you don't like or you don't agree with ascend to the highest levels of political office. Even the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Romans talks about his own places to go and things to do and people to see. So the question for today is, where are you? Are you in the flesh or Are you in Christ Jesus? Where would you locate yourself today? What's your status before God? Specifically, where are you with Jesus? Are you in the flesh and outside of Christ? Those are my questions. Here's what I want you to consider. Based on these passages, I want you to think about how everything is already in place. Everything, all the spiritual benefits, all the spiritual blessings, it's objectively already there. Where? In Christ Jesus. Because the story of the Bible tells you how he accomplished everything that's needed for redemption and salvation of sinners. And what he said on the cross was, it is finished. It's there. Everything is found in Christ Jesus. Everything. Even the good, the good and even the bad. Right? You, can, you can even find sin's verdict in Christ. It says guilty. And at the same time, you can find your verdict in Christ, righteous. Therefore, go to Christ. Position yourself in him. Bring your wounds to Christ because by his wounds, you are healed. Bring your guilt and shame to Christ because in him there's no condemnation. There is no shame. Bring all of your family, history, issues, and drama to Christ because there's adoption in Christ. Go to Christ humbly with everything that's wrong with you, and he will position you into the love of the Trinity in heaven. And now may the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies that are found in Christ. Lord Jesus, we honor you and thank you for not considering the position of being at the right hand of the Father in heaven eternally something to be grasped, but you've humbled yourself became man, 
and obedient, even to the point of death, even on the cross. Lord Jesus, we pray you give us eyes to see today and ears to hear the voice of our Savior so that we may know who we are, our identity in Christ Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing in response to our faithful Savior. As you go back into the world to your various locations, go in the grace of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And uh, you're invited to join us for snacks in the fellowship hall. <laughs>